Cool. Well, look, it's, thanks very much for coming. It's a really good turnout, which is fantastic. Um, we're the standardistas. We wrote this book last year. We crashed two cars. Uh, I broke an elbow, and uh, we both nearly got the syphilis uh, while writing it. Uh, we didn't actually get the syphilis. Um, this is Nicholas, and my name's Hello. Chris. Okay, and we're here to talk about... Uh, we're, we're, technically, we're here to do a UX masterclass, but secretly, we've sort of slipped something in under the radar, which is a talk called Start With Who. Um, so... If you're enjoying this, uh, there's this newfangled thing called Twitter, and uh, you can uh, follow our uh, crazy antics there. Uh, and uh, if you're really, really enjoying this, uh, the hashtag for this talk is start with who. So uh, uh, just get on your phones there. And, and we'd be interested to hear what your thoughts are. So if you could hashtag that, that would be fantastic. Plus, the uh, standard thesis approach, anyone who's ever been to a workshop or a talk or a lecture that we've ever done before, is to give away free swag. So we've got some books as prizes, and we have some very lovely uh, standard thesis metal badges uh, very last, last year. Um, and uh, we'll be giving those away as prizes as we go through the presentation. So today's presentation is going to break, uh, it's, it's broken up into uh, several parts. Uh, we have uh, UX isn't sprinkles, um, followed on by the UX recipe. Uh, which is a registered trademark, and uh, that's when you get your pens and pen pencils and uh, pens out, and uh, just write that all down. Uh, we want to, it's hard work, uh, why bother? Followed by the three uh, pertinent questions, what, how, and why, and after that we're going to uh, give you the secret source of success. And everything we're doing is built upon a lot of reading. We both teach as lecturers in the University of Ulster in Belfast. We run a master's course there, as well as teaching interactive design at undergraduate level. So obviously we have to read an awful lot of books. It's a part of the job. Um, we've been reading a lot recently uh, Richard Sennett's The Craftsman, which is this book with the pencils on it. Uh, Seth Godin's Purple Cow is relevant to this talk, but anything by Seth Godin is worth reading. And towards the tail end of the presentation, we'll talk about Malcolm Gladwell's Outliers. Again, anything by Malcolm Gladwell is... Uh, Fantastic. They're not really books about web design, but they're really important to what we're talking about today, which has an impact on web design. We're going to kick it off with uh, the first part, which is UX isn't sprinkles. And it's uh, kind of uh, got a little star there, and then you can read those sprinkles used judiciously are part of the equation. And we're going to sort of show you uh, how you can sort of sprinkle your design uh, to make it a nicer user experience, and uh, that's... So we're going to do that using a basic button that you'd find in an everyday scenario. So here we've got a pretty basic button, it's a kind of CSS basic box with a rectangle, and in and of itself it functions fine, and that's great. Um, we could put a bit of rounded corner chisel onto that, which would make it just look a little bit nicer, soften things up a wee bit. We could maybe add a little bit of noise to this, uh, which again, just make it look that wee bit nicer. Maybe stick a gradient onto the button. Uh, add highlights to the button to give it that sort of depth, that sense of depth, that 3D effect. Um, and finally, we could add a little text shadow to the text just to make that, that just that wee bit easier to read. Now, why would we do that? Those buttons, the top and the bottom, do exactly the same thing. When you click on them, they take you somewhere. I think it's to Amazon.com where you can buy our book. Um, but I, could, I, can't be sure, I can't be sure of that. Um, the top button and the bottom button serve a function, but the bottom button handles a kind of emotional function that we have. So the emotional part of design is something that we're really interested in. However, it's a little bit more complicated than that because user experience is not just about you know, uh, the latest sort of gradient chisel and all the drop shadows and all that kind of stuff. It is an important part of it, but it's more complicated than that. And now we reveal the UX recipe. So this is the bit at which you get your pens and paper out and start writing the stuff down. As opposed to the pens and pencils, because that just doesn't make any sense at all. Um, <laughs> or you can choose to write on a pencil if that is your desire. Okay, so we now reveal the closely guarded user experience secrets of the experts in a slide that is very hard to read, probably, it's from where not you are too standing. Bad, yeah, but, uh, we're going to go through this one by one, so uh, don't fret if you can't yeah. read it. Um, We're going to look at experience over time, uh, the relationship between information architecture and user interface design, interaction, usability, the fundamentals, and then something we call space dust. So the first part is really about managing an experience over time. Uh, when you go to a website, you're not 
you're not in a zone that doesn't exist outside of time. Uh, when you go to somewhere, you, it takes place over a period of time. So one of the things that you should really be focusing on is the thinking about the process of how that unfolds for the user. Because that can either be a great experience or it can be kind of fairly awful experience. Andy Budd does a great talk on this, or did a great talk on this, at the Build Conference last year in Belfast. And I'm sure we're probably not meant to mention the competition, are we? Um, but there you go. Um, in which he likens the kind of user experience to kind of going to a hotel. You can either have a great experience going to a hotel or you can kind of have a fairly awful experience going to a hotel. And you should think about the experience over time. I think X over T is, is R. That's ours, isn't it? Possibly, yeah, possibly. And then we have? Uh, we, have uh, uh, we have the IAUI uh, continuum here. And uh, basically what you're doing is building anything that you do uh, on a solid... Uh, foundation of information architecture and user interface design and without considering these things without sort of starting from the ground up you're not really gonna get anywhere uh, very fast so one of the things that we talk about in our book, which you might want to buy, um, is uh, the importance of posh markup at the kind of base level. And that's where a lot of the IA starts to happen in terms of your markup and how you mark up a page. Thinking about things like hierarchy and thinking about what's the most important, what's the least important. Unless you get that right, everything else is a bit of a waste of time. So that's something to focus on. And the next thing is interaction. Um, some people, when they sort of t talk about web design and they talk about sort of you know, I'm a great web designer because I know this application called Photoshop and I do flat comps in that and then I give it to some uh, developer guy to build. Uh, that whole thing doesn't really work anymore uh, because it does not take the interactions into account. What happens when you are actually interacting with the page? What happens when you mouse over things, the little sort of transitions, the little uh, movements, how when you click on a link where it brings you, how that sort of actually sort of happens, uh, ties into the experience over time thing as well. But these interactions are really, really important and there's something that you, you need to consider and you need to sort of, you, you need to be sort of more of a time-based um, kind of thinker when you're designing uh, your shizzle. <laughs> he says shizzle. I said shit. Sorry. My, my children all swear in my house. I said, Dad, what's wrong with fuck? You use it all the time. Um, so, yeah, the interaction part of things is really important because, you know, we're not working on paper here. And you can have interaction in really rich interactive experiences in a paper-based environment. But we have another layer of stuff which is time-based. And something we stress a lot in our teaching is the importance of narrative. So thinking about what is the story? What is the story that someone's going to get when they go to the site in terms of how, how you interact with things? So if we think back to the two buttons that we showed you, it might be that when you press that button, it sort of drops down a pixel or so, so that the user gets a feel that, oh, I've pressed that button, I've actually just depressed it into the page. So giving some thought to that is critical. Nothing of this, if you followed all the steps so far in the recipe, nothing of this will be of any use at all if the actual page that you're building, the site that you're building, isn't usable. Uh, the, it's, it's almost like we shouldn't have the slide up here at all because it's such a fundamental uh, part of the process you need to consider the usability in everything that you do. And it's, it's another fundamental big one on the UX recipe. And one of the things that we tend to find with a lot of students when we're teaching is that they've never tested anything on anybody, which is quite surreal. Um, so they'll kind of come to us at the end of the year and say, this is the work, to, let's assess it. And they think it's great. And we then sit down and try to use it. And we're like going, what do I do? Where do I click? We have no idea. And then the next question is, well, did you test this on anybody? No or they tested it on their mum. So don't test it on your mum or your granny, okay? Unless your mum or your granny is an awesome web designer with lots of experience, and then you can test it on your mum or your granny, okay? Uh, the fundamentals. Grid Fundamental. systems, typography, composition, color, all of these things you need to have a handle on if you're to be a great user experience designer or a great designer, full stop, okay? With all of those things used in the right way, combined together, they add up to more than the sum of the parts. And then the final part of the UX recipe is this thing that we call space dust. And as see you can it, see it's in on the, the, the diagram, diagram there. 
Uh, that's the space dust, and it's quite hard to get your hands on. It's the sort of thing that sets just an average designer apart from someone who is really shit hot. And that space dust, if you can get hold of it, just you know, sprinkle liberally. Uh, it is, uh, it's a wonderful thing. Um, <laughs> I would say it's like uh, spices in a recipe, though. Yeah, I would possibly. say don't sprinkle too little. You know, you need to think of all these things, so don't go nuts with the space dust. It's just a gentle tinkling. That's what we need, okay? So we've looked at some things there that added up together make for great user experience. And so you can see that if you're thinking about things like your grid system, your typography, your color palette, uh, the interactivity, the space dust, all of these different elements that we all need to consider if we're to be great user experience designers and design great things for the web. It, this is really hard work. So why would you bother? And the simple answer to that question is that we're now at a stage, I mean the web is still a very young medium, but we're now at a stage where there are enough people out there who can do the basics. They can do the HTML and the CSS. They can put together a completely functional website that's no problem, but you need to be a little bit better than that. If you're just able to sort of knock up a website, you're, you're basically no better than that guy in the bedroom sitting sort of working away on his Dell laptop. You need it could to be, be a girl in the bedroom. It could be. It could she be. could be yeah. using an Acer. Perhaps. <laughs> but you can no longer afford to be ordinary. You need to be a little bit better than that. Because as the limitations fall away, the user's expectations rise. So we are going into a rapid phase of development. We've got web typography is really coming to the fore right now with great companies like Typekit and FontDeck and TypeText Web Type Service. You know, we can start to do much, much more. So your clients and your users, your end users, are they're used to getting rich and exciting and engaging user experiences. So that kind of rubbishy thing that you could palm off on them before where you would lie, I'm sure we've all done this, and say, that's just not possible on the web. Uh, and, and your nose was kind of getting quite long as you were saying it. Uh, that kind of is starting to fall away. So as those limitations start to fall away, the user's expectation is going to go up. And it's your responsibility to deliver something that meets that expectation. So we now have a figure of how much better you need to be in order to be a great designer vis-a-vis -vis an ordinary designer. And that is 10 times. So you need to be <laughs> developing truth. something. I swear to God, it's the truth. It's 10 times. <laughs> You'll see, we're, we're, we're not just saying this. We actually have proof. Uh, you need to be delivering something that's 10 times better than the next thing that's out there. And a good example of this uh, is uh, Gmail. Gmail was just another web-based mail service. But when they set out, they were thinking, we're going to create something that's 10 times better than all the other webmail applications out there. And because they sort of delivered on that, uh, people started to switch. And people are, you know, it's kind of rare nowadays to see somebody who's, you know, uh, SpongeBob666 at Hotmail.com, because even sort of I think your mum's switched to Gmail. You know, it's, it's because it's 10 times better. You can do 10 times more stuff there than you could in your previous version. And that's the sort of way we, we have to start to think. And because people are kind of embedded into what they do, so they don't want to change. So you have to give them enough of a reason to change. And enough of a reason is 10 times better. Um, now, we didn't say that. That was actually this man here. And so this is the first part of the prize. What, this is for a standard Easter's badge. Very hard to come by, very rare. We only brought 64, a good computer number, with us today. Um, so who is this? OK. There's people at the back like waving their hands. And it's only because of Relly, sorry. It's Relly's hair. Sorry. Yeah, really. oh. Sorry. Oh, uh, if anybody gets hit by a flying badge, it's not our fault. So uh, if you could come and sign a disclaimer at the end, that would be fantastic. Um, so Seth Godin talks about this idea that you need to be 10 times better in order to succeed, in order to supplant the existing standard that's already there. So that's what you need to be aiming for, to be 10 times better than everybody else. Because there's a lot of competition out there. And the thing about it is that good user experiences pay off. Uh, I think 
that's all I'm going to say on that slide, and I think we're going to skip to the next one. Why? Do they... <laughs> Did you run out of things to say there? <laughs> yeah, I, I have the notes. That. He doesn't have the notes, so he's in a really tough position over there. So you know, give him some Got love. Give him some thing. love afterwards. <laughs> Good user experience pays off because it pays off in talk about ability. And this, again, you'll see the registered trademark up there. This is ours. We own talkaboutability.com. Don't uh, go there because there's nothing there yet. <laughs> expect to see something awesome at talkaboutability.com uh, maybe next year <laughs> when we get five minutes. Um, so great user experiences are talkaboutable. People go to the site. They engage with the site. They have a great experience. And then they tell their friends, oh, you should try Gmail. It's really, really easy. It has all this kind of auto amazing spam filtering stuff. It has all this massive mailbox that you know you can just search through. It just uses all of the Google search stuff. And they explain to their friends all the aspects of the, of the, 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 the thing that are making that thing kind of much, much better than what was there already. So user experience pays for itself in word of mouth. And this is the thing where you can start to go to your clients and start to say to them, well, look, why don't we take the marketing budget for all of those rather shitty ads and spend it instead on making something that's much, much better? Because if it's better, people are going to talk about it. And that's going to be much, much better for us in terms of growing the market or growing whatever your, your requirements are. Because people believe word of mouth more than they do adverts. It's, tr it's true. It's amazing, but true. And Nobody it believes that. It used to be the fact that, that you had maybe sort of, I don't know, three friends, um, and uh, you would tell them that uh, you should try this, this new thing. It's really awesome, or spiffing. Uh, and uh, those three friends would maybe go off and tell their friends. And after about a year or so, you had sort of 15, 20 people who would you know, actually know about that cool shit. But, uh, and they'd, with, actually, they'd actually be your friends? With the sort of advent of all the social stuff that's happening right now, you have an exponential kind of effect with, this is actually pronounced fluff, 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 and fluff, 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 fluff. Um, <laughs> and I also think we're registered trademarking that, but we forgot to put that on the slides there. Fluff, 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 fluff. So the that belongs to us. Friend, Don't be taking it, OK? The friend of a friend and the friend of a friend of a friend and the friend of a friend of a friend of a friend is now. And the friend of a 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 friend. Yes. Uh, all that stuff is kind of happening so much quicker now, and if you have something that's talkaboutable, in a matter of sort of minutes or hours or you know a day or so, you can have you know a hundred thousand people just sort of saying, "Did you see that thing? It is just bloody spiffing." So now we're on to prize time. This is the best part of the day. So what we're going to do to prove our point that great user experiences are not only talkaboutable, but are very memorable, and there's something that sticks in your mind, is we've got some tiny little crafted details, and we want you to guess who made the site and what it is. But before, and there are prizes. Before we go on to this, uh, we would like to extend uh, a thank you to Mr. Dan Cederholm, who uh, put two, uh, I think, of our slides into his slides this morning. So anybody who was at his talk will have a great chance to win this first prize, because you might have seen it earlier. And you really need to shout, put your hand like in the air, and then shout out the answer so we know who won. OK, so here's the first one. Are you ready? Is everybody ready? Ready? Yes. Are you ready? Yes. Come on, guys. Are you ready? Yes. Yes. Really? <laughs> oh, actually, there was a guy there. Sorry, you, you, you were kind of loud, but he was, <laughs> he was, he was kind of faster. <laughs> Yeah, here. I'm thinking that this badge throwing shit is not going to work. Especially the little pointy part at the back. I'm worried about that and <laughs> eyes and things. But so, yeah. Silverback app, right? We all did this thing, right? Thanks, Yay! thanks, thanks, Dan Cedarholm. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dan Cedarholm, for ruining it for us. Um, and we were talking to Andy yesterday, and he said the Silverback parallax effect, just the attention to detail at the top of the thing, led to over 20,000 notification signups in 36 hours, right? That was, that was Raleigh's husband. A round of applause for Raleigh's husband. Did you get a badge? I got a badge. Can I just see a funny story about it? You'll have to be really fast. Really fast. Brilliant. I was lying in bed 3 o'clock in the morning, bolt upright and went, I've got it. Fucking got it. And ran downstairs and did that. <laughs> <laughs> See? Look. I went, what the fuck are you doing? <laughs> The secret to good success is to sleep with rally. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, rally, sorry. Next one. 
Yeah. Pardon? Analog.com, yeah, or dot .coop, dot .coop. We'll, we'll give you that, we'll give you that. So come and get the badge after because I'm really getting worried about taking somebody's eye out. Okay, so yes, analog.coop or co-op or whatever you want to say. So there are lots of hidden things on the site. I kind of really not too keen on the word Easter eggs, but there's about sort of 50 of them in this site. Uh, the little detail we saw previously, if you pull on this image or double click on it, you can see what they're actually pulling with their ropes, and it's uh, some kind of chicken. <laughs> it is. It's, it's a I cock. I was going to say it's a cock, but then I thought... <laughs> just, just go right out and say it. It's a cock. Right, it's a cock. Yeah, they're pulling on a cock. Uh, so they, you heard it here first. Analog Coop are pulling on cocks. Uh, so there you go. Uh, talking to John about this yesterday, he said, we had so many offers of work, it was taking a week to reply to people. This was just within days of announcing this. Well, days, I think it was straight away. And the other thing that John said as well, which was really, really nice, was he said, the thing that came out of it for us was doing something benign that makes you happy is still the reason for doing anything at all. So if that is at the heart of what you're doing, I think great. So we're ready for the next one? Yeah, I'm ready. It's on. Come on, guys, are you serious? Anybody? No, yes, <laughs> yes, yeah, you. No, what, that? <laughs> Look, the, the glue is in the iPad's craziness. Yeah. Pardon? Noah Stokes? You get the badge. I'm not going to throw it at you, but, you know, Noah Stokes. So do you not remember seeing this page? No, are you kidding me? Oh, guys, nice. get out and do some research, for God's sake. Come on, call yourself web design. This is shocking. Noah, Noah Stokes. Stokes. Okay, I'm going I'm to just run with this. Noah Stokes uh, put up this page. It was this new kind of portfolio site. Noah Stokes is a front-end developer and other crap, and the uh, site goes on, and he's going to Ajax the shit out of any orifice of your site. Uh, this page became sort of like a real talking point on Twitter. It's about sort of maybe a year ago or so, and uh, I think you have some statistics there. I do on have some screen. statistics. This is why you guys need to look at this stuff, because you can't argue with these numbers here. Half a million visits within three days, half a million visits within three days, we're putting that up. Emails from inter for interviews from Apple and Facebook, and yes, he also was interviewed by Google. So, what can I say? <laughs> you, need to, you need to look at the source code of, in there as well, because he, he's not a moron, or he's not a mother futon. Very, very well written, very, very well conceived concept. Anybody? We're Beautiful up, slide. I'm one slide ahead okay, of you. Okay, one slide. Yes, yes, yes. No. Okay, this is, we'll give you a clue. This is a you guy. You guys who, surf the interwebs. <laughs> <laughs> this is a guy who art directs every every blog post. Yes, that guy down there who's finally, finally, yeah. You're just shouting out. Dustin Curtis, uh, Andy Bunt. Uh, is it Jeremy Key? There you go. All right. Okay, we're ready for the next one. There we go. So, Dustin art directs every single page of the site. So, if you go and have a look at DustinCurtis.com, he writes really intelligent articles. But not only are they really intelligent, they're also very, very beautifully designed to amplify the meaning. Next one. You, are you guys on the internet at all? <laughs> yes. No, it's not. So, somebody said things. Though. Things, yeah. Yes, culture code. Yeah, I'm not going to throw this at you. You're going to have to come up later and get it. That's OK. Uh, what they did was, uh, if you're a software company, one of the things that you have to do all the time is kind of communicate with your customers and either tell them that you're working on something or else, you know, you could choose not to tell them anything at all and it will all be a big surprise. That works too for some company. But what they've decided to do is basically make all the things that they're working on public. And they've done that with this absolutely fantastic uh, one page. It's cultureco.com slash status. And, uh, oh look, it's down, down there. there at the bottom. And you can uh, basically check out what they're working on. Will there be a version for the iPad? Who's working on it? What's the status? And it's really, really wonderfully uh, designed. This and, is the point of the yeah. talk at which I say we need to speed up. Because we're, we're up having too much fun up here. Okay. So this is where we get onto the really important part of the talk. 
Uh, and that is what, how, and why. And here we are at a moment about a week ago where we're looking at, this is our diagram of the talk we're going to do at the Future of Web Design. We have things like why, how, uh, UX, and you can't read all of that stuff, but come and have a look at it later. Um, so we've written lots of stuff out there, but it was missing with just one thing. We just weren't sure what was that just one thing that would kind of tie all of this together. And then this beautiful thing, serendipity, comes into play. We teach a lot of master's students on the Belfast course, and they're sitting there. Put your hands up. Yeah, that's our guys. Uh, we're proud of them. Um, and they, they were all coming in and they were doing their presentations and they said, oh, you need to watch this talk, Simon Sinek's How Great Leaders Inspire Action. Has anyone seen it? Well, write it down. It's great. Simon Sinek, okay? S-I-N-E-K. So basically so, what he says is, uh, it's, it's kind of a business E talk, but it has great bearing on designers as well. But what he's saying is all organizations and uh, careers uh, function on three levels what you do, how you do it, and why you do it. And the problem is that most companies don't even know that why exists. And this is like a really fundamental point. Um, we have some... S look at that. Look how it moves. This <laughs> is known as... Simon Sinek calls this the golden circle. And um, an example of uh, uh, an average ordinary company, say a computer manufacturer, uh, this is uh, from uh, Sinek's talk. Uh, he's talking about uh, someone like perhaps Dell who's making computers, uh, that's what. And they are amazingly easy to use, user friendly, uh, great, you know, solid machines. That's the how. Uh, and the why isn't really kind of coming into the equation at all. If you take another company like Apple, they would start from the center and they would say, why are we doing this? And it could be something like 1984's uh, Think Different. Uh, think Different, that's the why. That's the fundamental building block on anything that they would do. They would start with that why and then they would go how by making these you know, beautiful pieces of machinery, computers, iPods, iPads, iPhones, all that stuff. And that's the what, the actual product at the end. So, so let's test Mr. Sinex's theory and speed up. A and little. speed up. Uh, taking a look at a couple of examples we looked at there. Again, Rally, you can do a cheer. Um, we have uh, the Silver Backup page and we have the Culture Code page. You know, they, they're driven from the middle of the circle. There's the why part is really important in these companies, why they do what they do. They could have just built two pages that served a function and that you could sign up for the Silverback app or you could go and find out what's on the horizon, but they put a lot more work into that because they are driven by why. Um, so great, it's proven. But being academics, we like to take a look at what other people are doing, think is there a way in which we could improve it, and we think that there's something missing from Mr. Sinek's model. See those nice animations? Mm. Spent ages on those ages. <laughs> so what, how, why, and then something else? Do we have and a prize? And there is a prize for what is missing from the middle of the circle. What? Who? When? Who? Yes, who? who. Yeah, I can throw you this badge without taking you out. There you go. It's who. Who drives the why, and the why drives the how, and the how drives the what. It's who you are as a person. It's who you are as a designer. It's how you approach everything that is at the heart of absolutely everything. So this talk really isn't just about great user experiences. It's about how to change your career by looking at who you are. So we're going to test that. We should have had that slide up a second ago. But anyway, allow us some latitude. Oh, ah, oh, sorry. Who is missing from the middle part of that equation? Alan Sugar. <laughs> what? <laughs> what industry are you in? Uh, who's missing from the middle part of the equation for a badge? Jonathan No, it's not Jonathan Rife. Who said Steve Jobs? Steve Jobs. <laughs> I, think someone, I, I actually think it was someone back there. Did yeah, you seriously? I, 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 I'm going to go for this guy. Yeah. He had his hand up. But he also has like a Target t-shirt on, which is like our lecture on a t-shirt. If you want to know about our lecture, talk to that guy there with the Target shirt. And he will have the star pinned to the middle of the circle there. So that's where it's should put it. So let's test the theory. And this is where we have some prizes of some books, OK? This is the heavy stuff. So we've got three different people. And we're looking at the, the, the who part of the equation. Uh, and we've got a first slide that's kind of like grayed out or pixelated, so you have to guess who it is. So the first person to put their hand in the air 
and then shout out the name, is going to get a book. Jesus Christ. I mean, we may as well stop now. Who said that? Yes. That guy at the back there. Yes. What did you say? Heston. Heston. Our friend Heston. Heston Blumenthal. If we take a look at the who of Heston Blumenthal, do you, do you know who Heston Blumenthal is? He's a chef. But he's, he's not like just a, like any chef. He's like a crazy chef. Uh, he's a little crazy chef. That was a, <laughs> see what we did there? See what we did there? Um, he's a three Michelin starred chef, but he is also a magician. He's a culinary alchemist. He's an entertainer. But most of all, he's a boy at heart. He is the Peter Pan of chefs. And that is what drives what he does. Why? Because he wants to delight and entertain. He wants to push the boundaries of food. He wants to feed his guests. But most of all, he wants to create fantastic user experiences. So when you watch Heston's Amazing Feasts, or whatever it's called, it's the experience and the food that are important. It's not just the food. So let's look at the how. Liquid nitrogen. Mm -hmm. liquid Do you have something to say about liquid nitrogen? Yeah, it's very cold. Um, <laughs> <coughs> normally, you wouldn't sort of start to think that liquid nitrogen is something that you would bring into a kitchen. What Heston is doing is that he's looking at other industries and he's looking at chemists and he's looking at artists and he's looking at sort of people that are not necessarily working in a kitchen and drawing inspiration from what they're doing and uh, you know it wouldn't be sort of uh, too far fledged to sort of say that you as designers could start looking at other industries as well and just take that example on board. I mean look at these flasks you don't normally get those in a kitchen okay you normally get pots and pans well that's what's in my kitchen anyway um, but Hessen has like these flasks and these amazing measuring things and Hessen's also the guy who makes hot ice cream okay now that is like the opposite that just doesn't seem to compute okay but he sets himself a challenge and says how could I make hot ice cream um, and that is something about him and so that he sets that challenge and then he tries to deliver on it so now we know who he is uh, why he does what he does and how he does it. Let's take a look at the what part, which is the, the outer ring of the equation. Okay, some of you might not want to eat a snail like that, but I would. <laughs> Escargot, man, it's so tasty. Does anybody know what that is? It's, like it's a fried egg. It's a fried egg. But it's not like a, a, in the notes here it says, holy fuck, look at it. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like any fried egg I've ever seen. You know, every single thing about what he does is totally considered, okay? So the experience is not just the food, it's the whole experience. <coughs> Next up for a book. Okay, we're looking at a pixelated guy right there, but the clue is actually in the record player. But you might also want to look at this guy with the amazing beard and the pipe, because he is fucking awesome. <laughs> okay? Any, any ideas? No, he's a product designer. From the 70s, 80s? No, too, too, too young. Pardon? No? No? Yeah, oh, Jesus, you're getting like loads of shit down here. It's uh, Dieter Rams, yeah. Uh, des designs for Bram, okay? Exactly Internationally. Like pixelated there as well. Yeah, he's Sorry a bit about pixelated. That. Apologies for that pixelation. You see, if you hadn't said that, they wouldn't have even noticed. I know, well. You know. Because these people don't surf the internet or do anything. They're not even, they're not even listening to us. Um, so who is Dieter Rams? He's an internationally respected product designer. Okay? If you don't know Dieter Rams, go and have a look at his stuff, because we'll look at it in a second. Um, don't go and look yeah, at don't it now. Go, go, just <laughs> look wait, at it on our wait side. Wait till after the talk. Okay? <laughs> he is a product designer, but he's also an interface designer, as you'll see in a moment. He's an architect and a craftsman. Uh, he was trained as a carpenter, um, and he's unflinchingly <laughs> rational. Uh, he's German. So that all fits together. Uh, why? This is what drives, we know who, who he is, so why does he do what he does? Because he wants to create more with less. He wants to understand that the smallest details matter. So he's laser-like trying to look at every single thing. He wants to be as unobtrusive as possible, so he's removing himself from the equation. Um, and he's not got a big ego. Um, but most of all, he wants to create fantastic user experiences. So let's look at the how. Sweating the details. It's every single aspect of this is just reduced to functionality and it's really sort of trying to make invisible the signs and it's, it's just there's some absolutely beautiful <coughs> interfaces here it's not sort of too far um, out to sort of start thinking about these things as interfaces and also to draw inspiration from this kind of stuff uh, for sort of design work in other uh, it, 
or in the medium of, of, of the web. I think it's probably well, fair to say that we have a Dieter Rams exhibition at the Build Conference this year in Belfast as well. I'm sure we're not meant to say that. Sorry, Ryan. Um, so, in Dieter's own words, thorough down to the last detail. Every single thing is considered. The design is invisible. So his design is about removing the ego in favor of a richer experience. This is it, reduce, reduce, reduce. What can we remove from the equation? And by removing, deliver something that is bigger. And look, UI, anybody? UI? All happening there? Dieter Rams. And this is what he produces. He would call this honest design. It's not design driven by fashion. It's driven by function. It's not driven by what. It's driven by why. And all of that is driven by who. 1968. Uh, brown PS500 turntable tone arm. Uh, this is from 1968, but it exists outside of time. It is completely, it's timeless. This design is just not dating at all because he's removed everything from the equation and considered every last detail and boiled it down to the essence. And our last one for a book. Oh, was that? <laughs> oh, no way, you were there, you were there. Elliot, I didn't see you there. My so busy looking at that guy. Elliot's actually over here somewhere oh, in the shop. Sorry, 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 yes, so this gods of web designer there, Paddy Donnelly, one of our master's students, so if you want to study on a great master's course, this is our little pitch for that, talk to us afterwards. Um, and Paddy, look, at he's making a great name for himself, isn't he? Um, so, yeah, you don't need that book. Can you give it to somebody who needs the book? Yeah, we'll give you something else, we'll buy some beer, okay? But we'll give you the book if you really want it. Um, so, the final person in our equation is Tim Van Damme. <laughs> Isn't that great? It's a great photo. It's a great Who's pair of sunglasses. Who's those glasses? That's my sunglasses. I'll be wearing them later if it's sunny. Have you got them with you? Uh-huh. Yeah. Good yeah. stuff, good stuff. So who is Tim Van Damme? We had to put a web designer in just to keep you happy, okay? Uh, he's an internationally respected web designer, but he's also, and this is in his own words here, a craftsman of painstakingly pixel-fucked interfaces. <laughs> that, that's Tim speaking, pixel-fucker. A challenger of what is possible, a relentless innovator, and a great guy to hook up with over a beer. So why does he do what he does? Because he's passionate, he's generous to a fault, and he's more than happy to share his process at his blog, where he, where he writes under the alter ego of Max Voltar. To quote Mr. Zeldman, Van Damme, that's good design. <laughs> I'm not 100% sure whether that's good or not, but anyway. I think yeah, how, how can you argue with I Zeldman, for awesome. God's sake, you know? So he's challenging the status quo. He's pushing the boundaries of what's possible. He's refusing to compromise, and he's creating fantastic user experiences. And Tim was very kind enough to sort of show us behind the design process here. So this is the how part of the talk. He's pushing the curve. He's trying things out. He's working till 3 in the morning. Is he in your, is he with you, staying with you? Yeah. <laughs> 3 in the morning. They're all at your house at 3 in the morning. They're all going like, I got it. You know? So he's working. Has everybody seen this? Hands up. A few people. Good stuff. So he's pushing the curve and he's trying to solve problems. There's a lot of CSS animation y stuff going on here. As you roll over the Max Voltar, it says. Does it, it say? Says, I think it says Pixel Fucker. It does, um, yeah. Um, wow, I think we should give you a prize for that, actually. <laughs> Come and get a badge. <laughs> Max Voltar, Pixel Fucker, and something else. Yeah, right. Right. Superhero, is it? Is it? There you go. But even Maxwell Tarr, Tim Van Damme, starts in a sketchbook. So this is what you want to be doing. Don't go straight onto the computer. Think about it for a little while and write something down, make some sketches, and then go onto the computer. And you can see in his layers here, pixel yeah. fucker, superhero. superhero. Yeah. Let's look here. We haven't given you one of these yet, actually. Oh, it's stuck to my controller thing there. Pixel fucker, and what was the other one? Superhero, yeah, and Maxwell Tarr. Okay, so layers, 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 all in the, but all in service of a well thought out idea. And so what is the result of all of this? So this is the outer part of the equation. Uh, Dan, Cedarholm, again. Yes, he's a pesky Thank you, Dan. Guy. Uh, this, uh, you saw it this morning, really nice, really subtle transitions when you sort of move your mouse over the little icons here. And it's just a really nice, uh, very, very sort of well crafted, uh, and consider design. He's also been working on uh, the Gowala redesign. and uh, um, Everybody's yeah. loving that. 
And finally, something else that he's working on just now, an application for the, uh, for the iPad for favoriting tweets. Now, we cannot confirm or deny this, but we think that Tim might have taken some inspiration from the Standardista's gold star. <laughs> but we're not sure. But there you go. Coming soon, Fav Archive or Fav Archive. I don't know how you uh, pronounce that, but it's good for bookmarking Standardista's tweets. Okay, so let's look at this again, the three people that we've taken a look at. And we're looking at who the person is in the middle, and the why, because that comes from the who, and then the how, because how they do things, and then the what. And each of these three people, the who is the most important part of the equation. So you need to look into yourself as a person and think, what do you need to do to reach the next level up? So we promised you we would give you the secret of success, and we have got it here now. And the answer to that is who? You. Okay? It's not us. It's you. Know who you are, because knowing who you are will drive the why part of the equation. And if you've got the who and the why, then the how and the what will all just follow. So know who you are, and the rest will fall into place. Um, we have sort of shown examples of three uh, individuals who are kind of like superstars in their fields. Um, but there's nothing that would stop anybody who's, you know, doesn't aspire, aspire to the sort of superstardom to, to sort of still consider this, who am I and how will that sort of influence my process? And we um, have a figure for you here in terms of how many hours it will take you. So you need to be 10 times better. 10,000 hours is what it will take you to get to that point. And we have another standard thesis prize for anyone who knows what the 10,000 hours is from. <laughs> that's a badge. Fuck, that's a badge. That is a badge. It's so not Guns N' Roses, but that is a badge. Pardon? Yes, that's a badge. It's Malcolm Gladwell's Outliers. He talks about how the Beatles relentlessly practice and practice and practice. And he looks at the, the fact that, you know, the virtuoso concert pianists, they all have something in common. They worked really hard and they were constantly practicing. And you, there's no, there are no exceptions to the rule. You don't get a virtuoso concert pianist who has not put the time in. And equally, you don't put the time in and not become much, much better considerably as a, as a, as a consequence of that. So here we are at the end of the talk. Any questions? No, very We're shy. We're sort polite. of running five minutes over, so probably cut that. Well, short. what I would say is come and have a chat with us afterwards. We'll probably be outside smoking or we'll be propping up a bar somewhere um, after the talks have finished. Thank you very much for listening. At Standard Easters, hashtag start with who. Uh, come and talk to us over a beer. Thank you very much. Thank you.